Ok, uh, bueno, buenas tardes con todos los que están uh, siguiendo la transmisión y los que están presentes en, en la reunión. Eh, hoy día tenemos la siguiente presentación del Seminario Permanente de Filosofía. Eh, hoy día tengo el agrado de, de presentar a John Hawthorne, quien eh, nos va a presentar su uh, charla sobre la concepción del conocimiento basada en seguridad. Eh, John es profesor de filosofía en la Universidad del Sur de California y en el Instituto de Amelia. Um, de la Universidad Católica Australiana. Eh, John trabaja fundamentalmente en metafísica, filosofía del lenguaje, epistemología y temas sobre los cuales ha escrito libros como Narrow Content, The Reference Book, Relativism and Monadic Truth, entre otros, y numerosos papers uh, en dichas áreas también. Eh, John ha enseñado también en la Universidad de Rutgers, en la Universidad de Princeton y uh, en la Universidad de Oxford, antes de ocupar sus posiciones actuales. Eh, como en otras ocasiones, eh, durante la charla, los panelistas van a estar permitidos de hacer eh, preguntas aclaratorias y al final de la charla tendremos uh, preguntas de todos los asistentes que serán dirigidas a preguntas eh, Gaby, ¿no? que está ahí en, en el chat. Por el chat le pueden enviar sus preguntas. También pueden enviarle preguntas aclaratorias si es que las hubiera durante la presentación. Uh, well, John, um, when you are ready, we can start. Okay, well, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, and uh, my understanding is that the group will uh, just interrupt uh, as they feel, uh, uh, when they feel like it, which, which, which is fine with me. And, and Jaime, the, the plan is uh, an hour and a half, and then maybe some question, further quest discussion after that. Is that the idea? Yeah, that That's, sounds good. Okay. Um, I'm going to speak to a paper that I wrote with my partner, um, Christina Dietz. Uh, it was a paper that uh, was produced in response to an invitation by Luis Oliveira. Um, for uh, an OUP volume uh, on externalism about knowledge. The paper's entitled The Safety Conception of Knowledge, and what it tries to do is go over a bunch of interesting issues and choice points uh, uh, that having to do with the development of the safety conception and, and challenges too, I guess. Um, It's a very long paper, maybe 70-ish pages, and so I can just touch on some bits and pieces here. I'm not going to be able to try to talk through the paper. I'm just going to uh, touch on a, a, a few little bits in the paper. Um, just to, um, yeah, so um, the paper is very Williamson-focused. Uh, the reason for that is that I got interested in the safety conception, uh, largely because of Williamson. And to my mind, uh, much of the most sophisticated discussion around safety has been by Williamson. And he's the person that I hung around with at Oxford talking about safety. So just for a variety of reasons, um, it's Williamson focused. And it's the same experience for Christina. She, um, she spent, Uh, a bunch of time at Oxford, uh, was very influenced by Williamson, so it's a similar kind of story for both of us. Um, in Knowledge and Its Limits, uh, Williamson introduces the safety conception of knowledge by um, sort of intuitive ideas about danger. I mean, the, there's a quote, um, you know, if someone's walking right close to the edge uh, of a cliff, you might say they're in danger of falling and they're not safe. Uh, uh, if they're walking well away from a cliff, you might well say if the question arises, they're in no danger of falling and they're safe uh, from falling. Um, uh, in the case of the safety conception of knowledge, the danger that one's interested in is Uh, the danger of false belief and the safety one's interested in is uh, safety from false belief. Uh, Williamson's little gloss on danger is given there. I mean, it's very rough and ready. There's a danger of a certain kind of event, 
if and only if there's a sufficiently similar case where an event of that type does occur. And we'll come back to, uh, to that later. So when you apply the notions of safety and danger to the kind of uh, issue in question, we, uh, insofar as you're thinking of um, uh, knowledge as requiring safety from error, you get something like the thing that uh, I quote here and call basic safety. Uh, um, for all cases, alpha and beta, if beta is close to A and in alpha and in alpha, you know that a condition obtains, then in beta, one doesn't falsely believe that uh, uh, the condition obtains. Or in other words, uh, to, to satisfy the basic safety condition uh, for a belief that a condition obtains, uh, there can't be a close case where you uh, falsely believe that the condition obtains. And then Williamson and much of the rest of the literature then add a tweak on basic safety for the reason that it doesn't seem that for a belief to be, for many conceptions of uh, closeness at least, and more on that later, it, it doesn't seem that one needs to be safe in the sense of basic safety uh, to count as knowing. If I, if I believe the kind of case that I have in mind is where I believe uh, via one method uh, in the actual world, but in a close case, I have a false belief using a totally different method. I mean, suppose I see someone sitting uh, with my own eyes, but there's a close case where they're standing, but a liar tells me they're sitting. The fact that there's a close case where I falsely believe they're sitting because I ask a liar doesn't seem ha to have anything to do with whether I know in the actual case that I'm sitting. So uh, the, this, get, this kind of thought generates um, uh, a method refined test on knowledge where the basic idea, and there's something written down there that, that conveys this, the basic idea is uh, in, uh, a condition on knowing is that there's no close case uh, and condition on knowing that a condition <laughs> that 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 uh, a condition obtains is that there's no close case where using the same method as you actually do, um, you falsely believe that the condition obtains. So uh, that's people throw methods in so as not to generate an overly demanding conception of. Uh, 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 safety condition. Um, I say we say quite a bit in the paper about this method thing, and there's a lot to be said about it, but I'm not going to go into the, the method thing here. Um, I can in discussion, but I'm just not going to because I can't go into everything. One choice point that I'll come back to uh, that's uh, that you where you see some trans slight transition in, in emphasis in what Williamson was on about uh, in, in his written work is this in that uh, knowledge and its limits, safety appears as a necessary condition on knowledge. In some later work, he gravitates to one's talking about safety as something more like necessary and sufficient for knowledge. Um, in the 19, 2009 Amherst lecture, for example, he uh, talks about a conception of knowledge as safety from error. I think there wasn't some big shift in his thinking here. I think it's just for the, the my understanding is for the for the perp for his purposes in knowledge and its limits. He didn't have to get into whether safety was merely necessary or necessary and sufficient. Whereas all along, he sort of thought of it as a pretty good uh, first pass. Um, uh, uh, the safety thing as something that's necessary and sufficient. So I'll just 
tell you that. Um, I'm going to talk. There's lots going on in the paper, and I want to. I'm just going to pick up on three themes, four four little things to talk about. Really, one is how to think about closeness. Uh, one is uh, whether to think about safety as necessary or necessary and sufficient. Um, uh, and another is what I'll call symmetry, whether we should think of closeness as a symmetric relation. And then the final thing is a decision point as to whether to use safety uh, for modeling or analyzing. And I'll say something about that at the end. So four, four little, four little subtopics that I picked uh, that I think are Working through them will give you a better feel of what this whole safety theorizing thing is about. Um, the first decision point is, uh, well, how to think about this closeness thing. I've talked about close cases. Um, in some places I talked about, uh, you know, quoted Williamson as talking about danger, in other cases, similarity. How are we to think about uh, closeness. Um, what you actually find is that when you get into the safety literature, you'll find a lot of people saying, oh, they're kind of into safety. But uh, that's, uh, that apparent convergence belies an important divergence in how they're thinking of the relevant closeness relation. So really, there's a whole hodgepodge of views that differ according to how they're thinking about this closeness relation. And I want to, there's four or five different ways of developing closeness. Uh, I, th I think the, yeah, the five or six, uh, I, I probably mislabeled them. <laughs> there aren't enough letters here, but I'll, I'll just mention, um, mention them here. In at least some places, Williamson is extremely cagey about um, uh, what closeness is. Um, Goldman in some place says, oh, here, here we have Williamson uh, presenting uh, a non-circular necessary condition on knowledge. And then Williamson says back, um, uh, no, this isn't a non-circular necessary condition on knowledge. I'm not going to say, I don't want to say anything about too much about what closeness is uh without using the concept of knowledge itself so i'm not pretending that i can say what closeness it there's some independent specification of what closeness is that then gives us a sort of interesting test on knowledge so here's a quote by him uh in many cases someone with no idea of what knowledge is will be unable to determine whether safety obtains although they could use the principle that safety entails truth to exclude some cases those are not the interesting ones. Thus, Goldman will be disappointed when he asks what the safety condition account, sorry, predicts about various examples in which conflicting considerations pull in different directions. One have to, may have to decide whether safety obtains by first deciding whether knowledge obtains rather than vice versa. So in passages like this, Williamson says, hey, maybe we can't get any grip on what, uh, real grip on what, um, closeness is independent and that therefore what safety is independent of the concept of knowledge. If you're playing that game, there isn't such a thing as a counterexample to the safety account. There just isn't a, such a thing as a counterexample. There's some literature that's quote unquote presenting counterexamples to safety, but those counterexamples are only working against, against the background of a different conception of a, a sort of a more embellished conception of safety, of, of closeness than this. If you refuse to say anything about what closeness is, then it's gonna be not very easy to provide counterexamples. And where the only fixed point really is that every case, it's the only non-negotiable thing, which shows up in that, um, in that um, quote, is that every case is close to itself. Just from the fact that every case is close to itself, you can extract some, some structural lesson, you know, a false belief that already 
yields the result that a false belief can't be knowledge because if every case is close to itself, then a false belief case will be close to itself. And so the will automatically be a close case where you mess up if you have a false belief. We don't need factivity as an extra moving part. Um, and, but, but that's not gonna get us very far. You might wonder well, what the point of the safety conception is if you're not gonna say very much about what, what is and isn't close. And um, Williamson's idea is, hey, closeness models can actually be structurally illuminating about knowledge, even if, um, and structurally suggestive, even if you say very little about what's close and what isn't. So, you know, uh, just the abstract structure of closeness suggests um, the things, uh, there'll be kinds of intransitivities, for example, uh, that because things, even without saying much about closeness, we can sort of, uh, it's natural to think that things that are close to close cases needn't be close cases. I mean, we can at least uh, tap into that, that feature of the model. Um, and features like that of the model will already uh, might make the makings of uh, explanations as to why, say, KK fails. And that's uh, what Williamson says he's using these models for. And you can read the quote there, but I'm not going to read it out to you. So the idea is uh, it can be structurally illuminating, even without saying very, these, these safety models can be structurally illuminating about knowledge, even without saying very much at all about what safety is. You're playing that game then the counterexample game is a little bit out of place. Some philosophers, however, um, and I have an analogy there with it, epistemic logic, you know, where you model knowing by P obtaining in all epistemically accessible worlds and structural constraints on accessibility will predict certain structural features of knowledge even without saying anything very, very detailed uh, about what, um, what makes for a world being accessible or not. Okay, well, but some philosophers have been more ambitious and have tried to um, uh, provide much more substantive glosses on what closeness is and hence what safety is. And I think it's, instructive to look through a few of those ideas. You know, what a few candidate ideas for putting flesh on the bones of safety. Um, I mean, Williamson's initial presentation uh, uh, deployed notions like danger. So you might think that some gloss on danger or maybe more generally chance, which seems intimately tied to danger. I mean, danger is like the bad end of chance. Hopes and dangers are like the good and bad ends of, uh, 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 of chance, um, chances of good and bad things. Um, on the face of it, we seem to have some grip on uh, the concept of danger independently of knowledge. So if you're going to elucidate safety in terms of danger, you might think, well, we can say something quite substantive about closeness uh, using the concept of chance or danger. Uh, one way that you might try to do this is via um, notions of objective chance that figure in physics. Um, there are two things prima facie to worry about there. Um, one is uh, if you, I mean, the, the, one is if, if you go the route of taking um, uh, the, uh, the chance of everything in the past to be chance one, which is the way some people develop these things. I, I'm not saying, uh, all applications of chance in physics work that way. But if you, if you did develop things in that way, there's a risk that knowledge of the past will be too easy because there's no chance of the past being different. And so if you're dogmatic about the past being a certain way, then it'll look like you're kind of safe. 
for free. You might think, well, that's not the end of the world if, if it's only a necessary condition on knowledge, but it will mean that safety is going to do a lot less work than you might have hoped when it comes to knowledge of the past. And then conversely, you might worry that it makes knowledge of the future too hard. The way notions of chance tend to work in physics, there's at least small chances of uh, wild and wonderful things, all sorts of wild and wonderful things happening, you know like me having a brain aneurysm in the next five minutes is again you know, maybe a tiny chance of that if you are in the frame of mind of thinking well if there's a chance then there's a close case where it happens maybe not many but there's at least a close case where it happens then you'll end up uh if you if you develop safety in that kind of way by having a small chance to close case link um at least chance to close case link then you'll end up uh, with very skeptical results uh, you might um, tie try instead to tie safety to more ordinary notions of danger i mean uh, there's a little bit in that that amherst lecture about this too you might think that it's true that i'm in no danger of being kind of uh, of flying out the window right now even though um you know maybe there's a small small statistical mechanical chance of of that ha or quantum mechanical chance of that happening uh so you might think danger in the ordinary sense isn't so straightforwardly tied to uh chance in physics as all that but still uh the some of the themes I just touched on might carry over. Uh, um, I mean, suppose I believe that the, 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 the keys, um, uh, I'm outside a house and I believe that the, the keys will be found today. That there's a hunt for the keys. And suppose unbeknownst to me, they're already found. Well, there's no danger that they'll, uh, they'll, they'll remain lost. If they're already found, there's in fact no danger that they'll remain lost. So it looks like there's in fact no danger that uh, my belief that they uh, will be found by midnight is, is false. I mean, there's no danger of that being false because there's no danger uh, that the keys uh, won't be found since they're already found. So it looks like in some cases the the, It'll be very easy to pass the safety test, and then, uh, which will be big trouble if you think of safety as sufficient for knowledge, but might be disappointing even if you're not don't think it's sufficient. In that you might you might you you might hope to be using safety to explain more than it'll end up explaining if you gloss it in terms of um, in terms of danger. Um, there's a case in the paper, you know, if, if I optimistically believe a, a lion's right in front of me, I optimistically believe it won't attack. And in fact, unbeknownst to me, it's glued to the spot. Well, there's no danger of it biting me because it's glued to the spot. But you might think that kind of objective lack of danger isn't the sort of thing that makes my uh, belief epistemically secure. And uh, insofar as you want to use a notion of safety to explain the lack of security, you wouldn't want to gloss it in terms of, in terms of danger. Um, uh, good to remember too that, you know, there are all sorts of insurance tables that uh, risk people's, uh, that talk, estimate people's risk of dying from choking on food, struck by lightning and so on. I mean, that's what in insurers do. Um, if you think of those as showing that, well, you know, there's a there's a danger of me choking on dying from choking on food in the next week, a small danger, uh, and you tie safety to the presence of lack of the absence of safety to the presence of danger, then these sort of mundane uh kinds of risks that uh insurers deal with will entail that 
uh, I'd en entail all sorts of skeptical results. Okay, this should be C, but I didn't mark it right because I, I was a bit sloppy with this handout. Another bit of ideology, not danger now that people use to gloss safety here and there in the literature, is in terms of um, could not easily have been in error. Um, uh, it's the could not easily of the allocution that they use as the the uh, the canonical test for safety. Uh, um, a car, uh, you know, the uh, uh, a boiler is safe if it could not easily kind of overheat or mess up or break down or whatever. And the idea is you're safe from error if you could not easily have made a mistake and then yada yada using the same method. You can throw, throw a dose of method, methods relativity into all of this. So I'm not going to keep saying that. Um, um, uh, John, can I ask some, if, if one case is a sort of a counter example to the danger account? Um, I'm thinking about a case like the cosmic lottery case in which let's say we are about to make a judgment and unbeknown to us, like an alien civilization decides to like do a lottery. And if we win the lottery, they will not destroy us. But if we lose, like they will destroy us. And um, it, it turns out that we win the lottery, but it was like very, very unlikely to win the lottery. So it was very unlikely to like finish making the judgment. Uh, I, I wouldn't consider, for example, a case like that, a case uh, that, that actually is relevant to, to, to the judgment that we made. That is, even if we win the lottery, it will not be the case that our, like our judgment was not reliable or, or that sort of thing. Like that kind of danger is not relevant to so well, let's 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 start with this. So, um, you know, the 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 aliens like playing craps, and they they throw to die, and they agree that if they'll destroy our planet if it comes up double six. Yeah, is that good enough? I mean, maybe you want. Um, I mean, that seems a bit relevant to. I mean, it's a bit relevant to whether. I speak the truth when I, I say I uh, I know I'll be around tomorrow. Huh? Right, right. That that seems relevant, but only if your judgment is uh is kind of related to to the to whether like your Earth will exist or not. But I was thinking case. Uh, no, I was no, thinking I'm about. Thinking, I have. A, I just say I'll get pizza tomorrow. I'm not nothing grand about cosmology or the earth. I just say I'm going to get pepperoni. I know what I'm getting tomorrow for dinner: pepperoni right. pizza. And then, if what what unbeknownst to me, if the aliens throw two sixes, they'll destroy the earth. They don't throw the two sixes, and I get pepperoni pizza. So the, um, I mean, I feel this isn't terribly bad news for the danger thing. I mean, there's certainly a danger that I won't get pepperoni pizza on account of being blown up. Uh, if you apply the danger account to that case, you'll get the, the judgment, you'll get the result that um, I don't know I'm getting pepperoni pizza tomorrow, but that doesn't seem too bad to me. I mean, I don't want to like go all in on judgments about cases, but it doesn't seem terrible. I, I mean, it seemed odd to me because it's not related to anything that you're actually uh, judging, you know? Like, I mean, suppose I'm crossing the road and, you know, I think to myself, I'll make it to the other side. And in fact, there's a sniper that's shooting at me and just keeps missing. I mean, the sniper isn't related to anything I'm actually thinking. I mean, I'm not, uh, but it's a bit funny. I mean, I, I'll just be thinking, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be I'll be over the other side soon. I won't be thinking about snipers, but I mean, it's a bit. It seems a bit tendentious to think that just because I'm not thinking about snipers, then I'm sort of that gives me epistemic protection, as it were. You know what I mean? 
now and the the aliens seem sort of functionally a bit like the snipers and now you might you might think well whether it's one in you know um you know what the actual odds are but that wasn't your thought that the odds of the lottery you make you know because it's low odds of um uh that that makes a difference so yeah <coughs> Sorry. Um. <clears throat> All right, thanks. Okay, cool. <clears throat> um, uh, the short story is that they could not easily. One thing one's got to screen off is, I mean, there's a, there's a use of could not easily, uh, um, could not have done it with ease. And that isn't that isn't the use of could not easily. In, if I make make a mathematical mistake only through a lot of effort, as it were, if I hadn't have put in a lot of effort to this problem, I wouldn't have even got as far as make uh, make that mistake. Then I could not easily have made that mistake in the sense of I could not have made that mistake with ease. Uh, but that's that's not the notion of of it could not easily that, that these people are tapping into. So you have to set that to one side. Setting that to one side, I think a lot of what I just said carries over. The could not easily uh, gloss uh, makes things in some ways um, too hard and in other ways too, uh, too easy. I mean, if someone, dogmatically believes that they're going to die and happens to have um, a terminal illness that's currently symptomless, then they couldn't easily have been wrong. And so they'll pass the safety test. Now, maybe you could learn to live with that, but it'll be a test that's passed by dogmatic belief. Uh, in uh, it's pretty, pretty, pretty easy to pass that test by dogmatic beliefs in a, in a whole lot of cases. And that's something to at least grapple with. Um, and then uh, in the skeptical direction, I mean, if you've got a large group of people, it, it could easily happen that at least one of them, you know, dies by choking on food in the next year. I mean, you'd have thought. Um, and assuming that um, once you start to get into that frame of mind, uh, you start to worry about uh, um, um, skept skeptical consequences of taking the couldn't, couldn't easily locution seriously. Or I, I can't spend a lot of time on that, so I'm just gonna move on because I, I, I realize it. Um, another way to get a grip on close possibilities is just by direct, direct sort of judgments of similarity between possible worlds. And this seems to be Duncan Pritchard's approach. One thing, I, I don't think Duncan Pritchard under, knows anything about statistical mechanics. I mean, uh, here, here's a case Sosa talks about. Um, on my way to the elevator, quoted by, uh, yeah, it's, it's on my way to the elevator, I release a bag down the chute from my high rise condo. Presumably, I know that my uh, bag will soon be in the basement. And I know in the elevator that the bag's already there. When Pritchard discusses that case, he's thinking, well, there isn't a very similar case. I mean, assuming it makes it through and there isn't some hook there or anything like that, there isn't a very similar case where, where it doesn't make it down. But what you learn from statistical mechanics is, you know, there aren't many very similar cases. But there are some really similar cases where really wild stuff happens. I mean, basically, you can just tweak things ever so slightly, keep all the macro states the same, but tweak the microstates ever so slightly in certain ways. And you could get all sorts of wild and wonderful things happening. Once you sort of get realize that from statistical mechanics how the world works, you'll realize that these, uh, if you do close cases via direct similarity in the by a, by a sort of physical similarity, you know, if 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 there's a physically very similar case up to the up 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 to the relevant time where the bag doesn't make it down, then you don't know. Then you'll end up with very skeptical results. I can talk about that more late, later. 
And then I'm not going to go in. I, the, there's a whole long discussion in the paper about Sosa's way of developing safety, which is using this wood locution as, as uh, displayed by you would not believe P on less P. Um, you'll just have to look at the paper because I'm, I, uh, I want to have time to, to talk through a reasonable number of things. Um, Second mini topic I want to talk to you about. Uh, John? Yeah. Sorry, uh, before moving on, uh, I was just curious about the role that uh, belief in necessary truths play in these kind of discussions, because you cannot falsely believe those, right? Um, so people just, they're not important for this topic or? Well, well, there's a bit I skipped in section one that's relevant to this. So one, one tweak on basic safety is where you refine by methods, yeah? But there's another tweak on, base, on safety where you don't hold, <coughs> you don't hold the, um, the proposition fixed. So as it were, just spot me, I mean, maybe you can get the feel. Instead of holding the content of the belief fixed, have, some notion of an epistemically counterpart belief, which is a sort of a belief produced via a relevantly similar method, let's say, in relevantly similar circumstances. Just to sort of take, take, take the easy case from, I mean, suppose I guess the, uh, the answer to a sum, the, the might in the relevant sense be an epistemically, ep my belief might have an epistemic counterpart, which is in a different, is a belief in, in, in a necessarily false proposition. Once you sort of relax the, uh, the safety thing on that parameter, it's not immediately clear that safety has got nothing to say when it comes to necessary truths. So I, that, that does complicate things uh, a, a good deal. When you start to relax things in that way, uh, it becomes less clear how predict, structurally predictive the whole safety thing is. But, I see. Yeah. Do you see what sense. I mean? But yeah, that's uh, yeah, good. Um, uh, good. So I mentioned already that um, a big decision point if you're developing safety uh, is whether to think of it as a necessary condition on knowledge, or or think of knowledge as safe belief. Um, and I just want to talk briefly uh, about a few of the pitfalls of just running with the necessary condition. Uh, just a bit of background. I mean, I, I knew that uh, Pritchett was, uh, Duncan Pritchett was contributing this volume too. So uh, I've ne never written anything much about Duncan Pritchett. So it seemed like a good opportunity to say, various things about why I, uh, I, I feel various of his ideas about developing safety are very unpromising compared to Williamson. So but, but that's a little bit what's going on in this paper, if you wonder why. Suddenly there's bits and pieces about Duncan Pritchard in there. Um, so there'll be a little bit about Duncan, Duncan Pritchard in this section. Um, uh, so let's just think a little bit about developing the think the safety as a necessary condition thing. Uh, the simplest way of developing that vision would be to introduce um, some feature F such that a beliefs being safe was modally independent of being F. You could be F without without. Um, without being safe and you could be safe without being F and then, uh, but, uh, and where each of being safe and being F were singly necessary, but not sufficient for knowledge, but where the combo is jointly sufficient for knowledge. I just want to flag if, if there's very little reason for being optimistic uh, here and a wide range of proposals like that are going to run into the following difficulty. Uh, you know, typically, and it's a difficulty exemplified by the 
spaghetti a problem, but it has a more sort of general application. I mean, typically, if a belief that P is safe, so will the belief that P or Q, uh, I mean, uh, there's a methods issue there that I don't want to get into, but just spot me that. Um, and suppose Fness had a similar feature. Typically, if a belief that P was F, so a was it be a belief that P or Q, <coughs> then you're going to be able to construct cases where you have a belief that P that's safe but not F, and a belief that Q that's F but not safe. And then the belief that P or Q will be both F and safe. But the safety of the belief that P or Q will come from the P part and the Fness of the belief that P or Q will come from the uh, Q part. And what we predict is in a case like that, just as in a Getty case, you're not going to feel comfortable um, uh, calling, uh, calling that, uh, that disjunctive belief uh, knowledge. Um, I mean, suppose you thought you could be reasonable without knowing and knowing without, so re safe without reasonable and reasonable without safe, then you just get a case where you have a safe belief that P, a reasonable but unsafe belief that Q. It, one will be nervous about calling the disjunctive belief knowledge in that case, where the uh, the reasonableness and the and the safety come from different sources. If 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 you uh, you know the idea that those two things are individually just necessary but jointly sufficient will start to break down when you look at those disjunctive cases. <clears throat> um, uh, still, you know, not every analysis need to be conjunct. This isn't a general argument. It's just. A, a, a warning us to be careful about uh, um, about analyses like this. I mean, not every analysis has to be conjunctive. Um, <coughs> so that isn't a general argument, but it's it's it <coughs> it's reason to be nervous. Just, I mean, there's no general argument that we've got that you know. Uh, there's no analysis possible that makes safety a merely necessary condition and then add some other stuff. But uh, just by way of illustrating some of the pitfalls um, that aren't completely unrelated to what I just said, though they're not directly related, um, um, we talked through um, some various things we don't like about Pritchett's approach. So his big idea that you find repeated all over the place is uh, there are two requirements on knowledge, an anti-luck requirement, that's sort of the safety idea, and an ability requirement that, uh, uh, that your belief or the safety of the belief this evolves is the product of your cognitive ability. And we get this like slogan, uh, anti-luck virtue epistemology that then gets uh, sold, uh, that, that crops up in, all over the place in Pritchard's work and seems to have been taken up by a number of other philosophers. And here's, uh, and as of course, it has some quite natural affinity with uh, some of uh, Ernie Sosa's work, but I, I don't wanna get into the similarity and differences here. So here's, um, um, Here's a uh, pretty representative um, analysis by Pritchard. S knows that P if and only if S is safe cognitive success is the manifestation of S's relevant cognitive abilities where this cog safe cognitive success is to a significant degree creditable to S's manifestation of those cognitive abilities. And he doesn't wanna say, well, it's entirely creditable because of course you get help from the environment. I mean, your, uh, your safety, uh, it, it takes you and the environment to tango as it were for safety. Uh, you need your environment to be friendly and conducive. So that plays a big role in your safety. But the idea is that your skills make a significant 
contribution to your safety. So you don't just have to be safe, it's like your skills have to make a significant contribution. Doesn't have to be all that much. I mean, suppose uh, Jaime does all the work in figuring something out and then tells me, I mean, I could just be having beers, uh, not doing the work. Jaime does all the work. Uh, I trust him. Uh, uh, I, uh, you think I get to know what, what Pritchard says? Well, you know, I, I'm still, um, I still played. My skills made some contribution. I took a look at him and saw that he wasn't lying or he didn't have a smile on his face or, you know, it didn't say something completely outrageous. So I, I, I kind of, I, my, my skills play some role there. And so the picture is, even though he's doing tons of the work and I'm having beers, I still, my skills were still intact enough to play, you know, a, a decent role there. So I got to know uh, because it is somewhat creditable, even though he did all the hard math. So just, we can't overstate how, how much I have to be contributing or we get completely ridiculous uh, results in testimony cases. Uh, um, I, I think this is completely unpromising, this whole thing, but uh, there's, a, there's an extended discussion of this. Uh, I mean, just, just a few cases, I mean, there's one that I've talked recently. We've talked, well, uh, Christina and I have interacted a bit with uh, Duncan about this, um, this kind of case, because it comes up in, uh, in his own paper. Uh, that's the second kind of case. I mean, one kind of case to think about, I mean, suppose I get a belief by, an, and I don't quite contribute enough. So it's safe, but I don't quite contribute enough. So it doesn't get to be, knowledge, let's say, uh, look at his temp case. I don't want to go into how it works, but the, it's too much the demon helping you, not enough you, so you get to be safe about the temperature, but not enough credit. So I, I, I get to safely believe it's roughly three degrees, but um, not, not enough credit for that to be knowledge. But I can now make an inference from it's roughly three degrees to, you know, it's roughly root nine degrees. Well, now I'm doing a bit more work here, or it's roughly a uh, cubed root of 27 degrees. Now even more work. And then if there's, if there's the, the fancier the math, the more I'm contributing as it were. I mean, it just seems completely ridiculous to think that I don't know that it's uh, three degrees, but I do know that it's, uh, a uh, cube root of uh, 20, 20, 27 degrees. Uh, but, you know, I am contributing more skill, more, more, more input. Uh, there's more credit going on to my skill with the 27 one than the three one. Uh, I don't think knowledge patterns this way. Another kind of case. Uh, a quick question about that. Like, yeah. uh, wouldn't like the, a uh, virtue epistemologist replies something like, oh, the skill has to be relevant to the case at, at hand. Like, for example, if, if you- Well, it is relevant. Like if I messed up the math, I'd be getting the wrong thing. I mean, it is relevant that, that, cubed, that it's cubed root 27. I mean, I have to, it is relevant to the case that I know that the cubed root of 27 is three, right? Oh yeah, but, but none of that was relevant to like knowing if it's, Three degrees outside, or it has no, to no, like no, fill, I didn't say I know it's three degrees outside. I said I knew it was cube root twenty-seven by degrees outside. Right, That's but the question: Do I know? I mean, you, you had like you covered one gap with your mathematical ability, but you still missed like another gap. So I, right, I but, but remember what's going on with. That's why it's good to look back at that Jaime case. I mean, I did a bit of work screening him for being an obvious liar. He did the rest of the work, so. The, there's this division of labor going on all the time where I, my skill is only doing, it's only part of the story and the world's doing the rest of the story. So right. the trouble is if you make the, the demands on my contribution too demanding, then you might get the good, the good result in the 27 case, but you'll get a bad result in the testimony case. And you see the challenge of trying to 
trying to strike the right balance. Right, thanks. Um, another kind of case um, we've interacted with a bit about, I mean, I'll call it, I call it uh, fake barns with demonic protection. So here's how it goes. I'm, I see a barn in fake barn country, but I have demonic protection in that if I, or angelic protection maybe, because angels, I guess, uh, angels do nice things. So that's, I should call it angelic protection. Uh, Angel Gabriel, if I uh, approached uh, a fake barn, would just whisk the freight barn away to stop me falsely believing that there's a barn. You get the case? I look at a real barn. There are various fake barns scattered around. Um, uh, but I have angelic protection. Uh, if, you, if you kind of think you don't know in the original fake barn case, it's kind of natural to think you don't know in that case. I don't, I, don't, I don't like doing epistemology by cases, by the way. I mean, it's not like my thing, but, you know, um, but I think it's good to see some structural things going on. Um, what Duncan wants to say is, oh, well, the reason you don't know is that your safety is entirely thanks to the demon. Um, and I just wanna go through a few thoughts there. First is just wrong that my safety is entirely thanks to the demon. I mean, uh, I mean I'm mean, i contributing much more than he realizes. I mean, if I looked at the sky, I wouldn't think I was looking at a barn. Uh, why? Because I'd use my perceptual skills to see, oh, it's a sky, not a barn. If I looked at my shoes, I wouldn't, falsely believe there's a barn in front of me. Uh, I, I'm looking at a barn rather. I use my perceptual skills to realize it's my shoes and not a barn. So there are tons and tons of cases nearby where uh, I'm using my skill to, uh, to avoid a false belief that I'm looking at a barn. Um, lots of cases. So, you know, it's very unclear why that, uh, and, you know, I'm thinking my belief that it's a barn now involves my, uh, my ability to uh, sort of, you know, apply a barn rather than cottage or castle schemas to my perceptual input. So, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of perceptual skill going on that is a significant contributor to my, to my safety and this idea that it's all thanks to the demon is just a bad idea. Uh, so it's unclear to me if you wanted the judgment that you don't know why you're gonna get that judgment out of anti luck virtue epistemology. And moreover, I can ratchet up the skill and it's not gonna make, I feel it would be really weird if it made a difference. You know, suppose instead of just an ordinary barn, it's a kestrel and there are, there's a mix of half fake kestrels, half kestrels in the area. And then there's a bunch of other birds. And I'm a super skilled ornithologist that, um, uh, and only thanks to that, I can distinguish kestrels from other kinds of birds. There's a whole bunch of nearby, world, nearby cases where the angel uh, whisks away the fake kestrel. It's the same idea as before. There's angelic protection on the fake kestrel. Uh, but in that case, like my, my skills are even more manifest and I'm, you know, there's a lot of skill going on uh, that's making a significant contribution to my safe belief, but uh, I've got no idea. Uh, uh, I'm, I, I get no sense at all that you'd wanna say, well, when it's a mix of kestrels and fake kestrels with angelic protection, you do know but when there's a mix of real barns and fake barns with angelic protection, you don't know. I mean, that just seems like a really weird place to draw the line, but uh, there's a risk that you'll be drawing lines like that if you sort of have this uh, skill theoretic, a uh, skill-driven account of the, the contours of knowledge. Okay, third mini topic. Uh, John, may, may I jump in with a question? Yeah, definitely. Anyone uh, can jump in anytime. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Don't you think that maybe the real disagreement between uh, the defender of safety epistemology and the defender of anti-lock virtue epistemology is like probably the notion of skill or, or of skillful cognitive ability or something like that? Do you have some views on that? I mean, I, I, I just don't know how to develop the thing in a way that makes much, I mean, on the face of it, when I learn things by testimony, I don't, I, I don't exercise much skill, you know? And on the face of it, I know stuff. So however you do the skill thing, it can't be a lot of skill. It's just got to be a little bit of skill. And the other person can be down the world or including other people can be doing nearly all the work. Whatever notion of skill is, if you need skill for knowledge, it can't be very much of it. Right. Um, but once you sort of realize that, trying to use the, the level of skill involved to sort of control for the presence and absence of knowledge just, just seems so unpromising to me, I can't get into it. So I just, I just it all seems like a complete non-starter to me, but you know, I'm a bit biased, but that's, you get a bit of a fit. I'm just trying to give you a gestalt of where I'm coming from. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, symmetry. I think it's a... This is a cool topic that I think... Jeremy Goodman clued me into this topic more than anyone else, I think. So we've got these initial examples uh, to do with, you know, danger and cliffs or balls and holes, and if you look at Williamson. But then we've got a certain kind of model <clears throat> that uses uh, a relation of closeness between two cases. I mean, the choice of I mean, the choice of closeness would be the word closeness would be a very bad choice of word unless closeness was supposed to be a symmetric relation. I mean, the way that the most obvious feature, features of closeness are reflexivity, things are close to themselves, and symmetry. If a thing X is close to Y, then Y is close to X. And if we're modeling using the lingo of closeness, but we didn't think of closeness between cases as a symmetric relation, uh, then the word close wouldn't be wouldn't be an apt choice of choice of language at all. Um, but modeling things using um, a symmetric closeness relation uh, quickly raises some interesting puzzles, both at the level of cases and in the abstract. And so I want to talk about some case-based challenges and then some uh, sort of a more abstract challenge. I mean, here's a case-based challenge that connects quite intimately uh, with, a, with a, an interesting paper written by Ofra Magador. Um, the way safety lovers tend to think is that, well, they don't want to be skeptical typically, so they think normally embodied people um, get to um, know they're not brains in vats. And so, and typically what they invoke there is the idea that um, that case, brain in vat cases aren't close. They're too far away to be knowledge depriving. That, that's uh, not close enough that's uh, a recurrent theme. But then if closeness um, is symmetric, what that means is that <clears throat> normally embodied cases uh, look like they're not gonna be close to brains in vats. If, if brains in vats aren't close to nor any normally embodied case, uh, and that's a bit of a placeholder, but we try and be a bit more careful in the paper, then, um, uh, then uh, uh, if brains and vats aren't close to no, any normally embodied case, then normally embodied cases won't be close to brain and vat cases. But what that then seems to mean is that if a brain and a vat dogmatically thinks 
it's not normally embodied, uh, that'll be safe because there won't be a close case where it's normally embodied. Uh, and that seems very weird. Uh, interestingly, Ofra is sort of up for that conclusion. I mean, that's the gist of the paper. Um, um, find the detail. The, the thing I, I should have put all the references in this hurriedly produced handout, but I forgot to put in any references. But it's it's in the paper that was distributed to you guys. Um, all the all the, the relevant references. Uh, I'll just get this one right, right now. Um, the, it's how both you and the brain and a vat can know whether you are embatted. And I think it's uh, uh, 2018 Aristotelian Society something. Uh, so that's that 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 kind of thing would get take a lot of getting used to, and I think in a way it gets it would require even more getting used to in. Um, in some even more mundane cases. Um, I mean, suppose you've got a perceptual appearance of us thinking now of these sort of appearance reality models that Williamson and others are, are interested in. Suppose you've got a perceptual appearance of a certain quantity, say temperature, and just to simplify following those models, let's suppose that the facts of closeness depend on two things, the actual temperature and the apparent temperature. Um, you know, so you might think if if the if the actual temperature is seventy and the appearance is seventy, then uh, then uh, you might think a case where the actual temperature is eighty and the appearance is seventy that's not close. You might think well, if the among cases where the appearance is the same, just as a toy model, you might think it's got to be within five to be close, you know, among the cases where the appearances are the same. So that means if it's 70 70 on that kind of toy model, uh, appearance 70, real value 80 won't be close. Um, and then if you have symmetry of closeness, then uh, a case where it appears 70 and is 80 uh, will be such that a 70, a matching case won't be close to it. That's what will happen if you have closeness as a symmetric relation. But then if, you know, you'll get some, su some surprising ways to pass safety tests that, that mirror, mirror um, offers results, except uh, Maybe, maybe these are even more bizarre. I mean, suppose there's someone that dogmatically thought that appearance underestimated reality by 10. So when it appeared at 70 to this creature, it believed it was 80. When it appears 82, it believes it's 92. So you've got this bizarre creature. Um, suppose in actual fact, it's, um, I messed up. So I got it wrong. It, it, it believes it's underestimating the temperature, but what it does is when it, when it um, appears 70, it believes it's 80 plus or minus five. And when it appears 80, it, appear, it believes it's 90 plus or minus five. I mean, uh, for, for safety, Theoretic reasons, anyway, that you know, very precise beliefs is no no chance. So it, it has it. It's believed range is always like is always uh, is always off in the way that I described from the appearance. So it appears seventy. It believes that it's eighty plus or minus five, and suppose it's in fact eighty. Well, on the on the kind of appearance reality model I just gave you, it's belief that it's uh in the 75 to 85 range when it has an appearance of 70 will pass the safety test because it's in fact 80 and the only close cases where if if the appearances where the appearances match and suppose it as it were knows its appearances 
are ones where the reality is within five of its actual value, then it's going to be safe. So you're going to have this creature bizarrely passing safety tests in cases where the appearance is 70 and the real value is 80 uh, by it having this systematic practice of, uh, of taking itself to underestimate. And it's not like that general systematic, you know, it's not like it's doing great systematically. It's just in a case where it's in fact 80 and the appearance is 70, it's going to be safe on this uh, symmetric way of of thinking about closeness, which is strongly suggested by the very word close. There's a more abstract concern too, which is um, it's standardly, uh, which I think is how, how Jeremy got into this, which is the, um, the asymmetry of epistemic accessibility is one of the more established phenomena, at least among uh, non-skeptics. There can be a good and a bad case, where the bad case, the e good case is epistemically accessible to the good case, uh, to the, the good case epistemically accessible to the bad case, but not vice versa. So that's the asymmetry of epistemic accessibility. But uh, a good question is, well, how are you gonna predict that? from the safety theoretic way of modeling knowledge. Um, I mean, closeness models don't predict this at all. I mean, if one A is close to B, then B is close to A. So if closeness was the hallmark of accessibility, I mean, so on the simplest version of the models, a, a case is accessible to another if and only if it's close to it, you wouldn't predict asymmetry of epistemic accessibility at all. Um, so if you're going to have um, symmetric closeness as your central modeling tool, you've got at least got your work cut out. I mean, there are all sorts of things you can try. You can try various method theoretic ideas, but you've got your work cut out to explain where epistemic accessibility, asymmetries in epistemic accessibility uh, are coming from, whereas other kinds of models of knowledge that don't deploy uh, a symmetric relation as, as the central modeling tool have a lot less uh, of a challenge in this way. Uh, for example, I mean, in the paper, we talked through that about the Goodman and Sallow uh, models that use a, uh, a way more normal that one of their central sort of uh, concepts is a way more normal than relation. I mean, that's overtly asymmetric. Um, uh, if A is way more normal than B, you're not going to have it that B is way more normal than A. If as your sort of first pass idea, you had it that, well, um, you see worlds that are sort of a, in an appearance case, you see worlds that are a, apparently uh, the, the same, but uh, that aren't uh, way less normal than you, just to take one version of this. You, you see all the ones that aren't way less normal than you, then you'd have a ready-made um, explanation of asymmetries of epistemic accessibility. For example, you might think an appearance um, 70 and reality 70 uh, was way more normal than an appearance 70 and a reality 80. And so, that would explain where, why when it's 7070, the case of 7080 is not epistemically accessible. But you might think when appearance is 70 and reality is 80, the 7070 case is way more normal than that. So if you're in the 7080 case, then the 7070 case is epistemically accessible. So that's just a sort of little toy illustration of how using an asymmetric relation as your central modeling tool might make it much more vivid how uh, asymmetries of epistemic accessibility would arise than in if you used um, 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 a, a symmetric closeness relation as your central modeling tool. Um, John, can, can I ask you a question? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, so I was just curious about, what, so I, I guess I don't have the intuition that 
I guess I'm just curious about why the symmetry of epistemic accessibility is thought to be an established phenomenon. Um, well, like, is, is the idea that cases like the ones you mentioned motivate that kind of asymmetry? Or yeah, I, I mean, it's it's taken being an established phenomenon at least among non-skeptics. So non-skeptics are thinking them to themselves two things. First of all, I know I'm not a brain in a vat. That's a hallmark of anti-skepticism. I know I'm not a brain in a vat. But second of all, nearly all of them are thinking, uh, hey, brains in vats don't know whether or not they're like me. So I know I'm not like them, but they don't know whether or not they're like me. I mean, it's not like they know they lack hands. I know I have hands, but they don't know whether or not they have hands. So they must be accessing cases. They must be accessing uh I know I'm not a brain about the lacans, but they, for all they know, they're a normally embodied person, yada, yada, who has hands. And so if you think of uh, an epistemically accessible case as one that for all you know is actual, then for all they know, my world's actual, but I know that their world isn't actual. And then that's, that that's getting you epistemic uh, that asymmetry. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I guess so. So, so the idea would then be like, so I guess the brains in advance don't have the mechanisms to even to, to even know that they would be brains in bats, right, or anything like that. Or I'm, yeah, I'm, I mean, I the, I'm the, the brains in bats I'm thinking about are sort of like ones with that are have visual appearances just like mine. They have kind of visual appearances just like mine. They don't have anyone whispering, hey, you're a brain of that. They, it's a standard brain of that case where they're, they're, they're being manipulated by super scientists to have appearances very similar to mine. Right, right. I guess, I guess I was wondering like, if you could be externalist enough that you would accept that the brains in a vat um, can know, like you're, you're right. fine with saying so, that. So know. that's right. So that, it, that's what Ofra's doing, exactly. That's that's her thing. She thinks, hey, I'm going to be super externalist. And so you, you were asking me sociologically why it's an established phenomenon. And I answered, sociologically, people tend to be up for them knowing they're not brains in vats, but not up for brains in vats knowing they're not embodied. And that, that lends itself to these asymmetries. If you go Ofra's way, then you're not going to have that intellectual path to asymmetry. Um, and then you, the, the, I, I, I tried out some other cases, and then you might see how you feel about those, you know. Uh, you know, when it's 70 degrees, I know it's not 90, but in a really weird case where it's, it's 90, but appears to be 70, I'm not in a position to know that it's not 70. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I guess I was wondering if, in, if even in those cases, one could like still, um, maybe this is like a related question, but so I was curious as if to like, the idea here is to kind of gloss know how we use it every day and how much space there was for somebody to say like, look, okay, there's this everyday notion of no, and in some cases, you know, it's gonna be weird to say that we know, but look at this other super useful notion um, no plus that we could profit more from. And okay, fine, those cases, let's discard them or something like that. Well, yeah, so, so a lot of people are thinking, well, they wanna talk about what we're talking about when we say no, so that, that's true. That, but um, you might wonder anyway, um, I mean, how useful it is to have a notion that has this symmetry. I mean, just in terms of the sort of the, if we had some cognitive science modeling of visual perception, you might wonder how useful is it to have, um, to have models where you can, know, know that it's roughly, that it's not roughly 70 degrees when you have an appearance of 70 and a completely bizarre world out there where it's 90, you know? 
uh, I mean, I'm just wondering for what it's, it'd be good to, to wonder for what purpose, theoretical purpose, uh, it would be a good idea to have a symmetric thing like that. I mean, that's an yeah, open that makes, question, but that makes total sense. Yeah, thanks. I have a, a related question. Uh, mm -hmm. So like all of these are problems with symmetry, but I wonder how bad would it be to just like drop symmetry and, and, and conceive of the relation not as a right. similarity right. So, relation, so, but just like, like the counterpart accessibility relation, which is not exactly symmetric. Right, so that's what happens in the paper. We, um, there's a whole big chunk of the paper that I'm not going through where we say, let's just have a, a counterpart relation or a relevant to relation, I think we call it, but you know, we even call it that in some places, which is not symmetric, in which case you drop that aspect of the modeling. And then we talk about other, 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 other themes from the safety literature and see how they play. Uh, yeah, that's a perfectly good proposal. And then uh, um, that's what goes on in part of the paper. Um, one theme in the safety proposal, here's one, one, one thing that we explore, but I'm not gonna talk about now. One thing in the safety, the one idea, it's kind of gestalt -er idea you have in the safety literature is, if you have to tweak the world a lot, um, then it's kind of irrelevant. That, 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 that's one idea that you have. And some of these examples put pressure even on, on that idea. You don't want to think that the 70-70 case is irrelevant when it's 70-90. Uh, but you know, it's not like it's just a small tweak in the world to get to the 70-70 case when it's 70-90. I mean, the external conditions might be completely bizarre and it might take a big tweak to get to the 70-70 case. So it might not just put pressure on the, 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 the formal aspect of, of, of symmetry in the modeling, but it might also put pressure on the sort of in the sort of the idea that you find in a lot of safety theorists that states of the world that will take a, a large tweak to get there are sort of epistemically irrelevant. Uh, and that, 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 that one might start to find that that under a lot of pressure, but uh, uh, I'd refer you to uh, we, we in an open ended way explore a whole bunch of stuff, including Boltzmann brains and all sorts of things in uh, um, uh, in the paper, sort of uh, in, in this spirit. So yeah, that's a good question. Um, the final thing I'll just say a little bit in terms of my little tour of some issues about uh, safety is this, there's a little section in the end uh, that entitled modeling versus analyzing. And it again, sort of part of the paper is to sort of map some features of how um, uh, Williamson's written work on safety has evolved. Uh, it's one of the things going on in, in our paper. And uh, one thing that we uh, point out is that Williamson's increasingly played up the value of model building in epistemology as opposed to analysis. And there's uh, analogies drawn with modeling in, um, in economics and more generally in social science and so on, where um, you get a very precise model that makes very, pre very precise predictions about various scenarios. Uh, the hope is not that the predictions will be true, but that the model is a pretty good approximation and that you can learn quite a bit from the model uh, because it's a good approximation. I mean, think of this simple appearance reality model um, where you just assume that whether you know depends on just two factors, the appearance and the real value. And so, for example, the, the way that light wanders from the real value to the, to the appearance in the case of perception is deemed irrelevant. 
but it's obviously not irrelevant to whether you whether you know. Uh, if you try to just flat-footedly extract generalizations from that model, every single generalization would be false, pretty much. Uh, so the idea isn't to generate true generalizations, and the idea and the role of counterexample is is much more peripheral to this kind of model building. What's going on increasingly is Williamson saying, hey, I'm doing this safety thing for as a model building rather than an analyzing exercise. We have a whole section trying to understand what that comes to, but the detail, you know, how you put flesh on the bones of the, how much refinement you go into with, with uh, in terms of refining the notion of safety might depend a bit on what your ambition is in the first place. If you're doing this model building as a helpful approximation rather than model building as analysis, uh, there might be a bunch of refinements that you uh, don't want to bother with because the whole point is to keep things simple and precise. Uh, I feel maybe uh, that's about enough for now. Is that all right, Jaime? I mean, there weren't that many interruptions, so probably spoken for some total of over an hour uh, at least. And I feel people have had enough of me at this point. So uh, I'll call it good. I, I, I'm, ha I'm happy to have discussion. Uh, I just, I'm not going to carry on, carry on giving a talk. <laughs> I'm going to yeah, call it good. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Can I have a break for a minute to just get some wa I, water and uh, my throat's a bit dry? Is that all right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Great. So thank you, uh, John, for your for your great talk. Uh, I'll be well, I'm, I'm, I'm clapping virtually. Um, I'll be the one tasked with calling people for to to to, to start asking their questions. Uh, first up, I think Edward has a has a question. Yeah, hello, Jan. Thank you for, for the talk. It was really, really great. Uh, I have like two general questions. Um, so one is, what are your views on the relation between or the role that safety may play in the skeptical challenge? Um, and the second one is whether uh, you think safety uh, is consistent or compatible with closure, with epistemic closure. Okay, so that's that's good. The um, I'll take those in reverse order. So, um, basic safety. Uh, at least on, on lots of natural ways of thinking about closeness, maybe is not uh, is not friendly to closure. Um, and a bunch of people in the literature, and Brian Weatherson comes to mind, but I think a bunch of people uh, have have uh, have noticed uh, this. Um, I mean that the 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 easy way to see it is via a case where. Um, you safely believe P, you wouldn't easily believe P falsely, uh, but you would easily believe Q falsely. You safely believe P, you infer P or Q, uh, uh, and let's suppose, and let's suppose you, uh, let's just have safety is necessary and sufficient so we don't mess around, okay? Just to keep things easy for now. Or we could just ask directly whether whether closure is right for safety and then worry about knowledge later. But I mean, if safety is only a necessary condition, there'll be a few epicycles on this. But um, but let let's let's just ask directly: is is safety um, is safety closed uh, under under uh, under de deductive consequence and so on uh, in the you might not safely believe P or Q because there might be a close, a close case where you falsely believe Q, where P is false as well, and where you infer P or Q from Q. So 
if we're playing the basic safety game, uh, we're uh, not going to think uh, safety is closed under, uh, under competent deduction. And so uh, that, that uh, we're unlikely to, we, we, we um, might, if, insofar as we think of, uh, it's going to be very hard to see how knowledge is going to be closed under competent deduction. But things get a lot more complicated when you start to refine safety. So just to take the case in, at hand um, that I just described, you might think, oh, if you believe P or Q by deduction from P, that's a different method to when you believe P or Q by deduction from Q. And so, you know, once you go into this methods refined closure game, um things things uh uh it becomes uh, a lot less clear that uh closure is antithetical to um uh, so sorry safety is antithetical to closure and in fact Will williamson's williamson's hope is to think of developer conceptions of methods in such a way that uh you uh uh uh, it, it will be extremely friendly to closure, both single premise and multi premise. And you can sort of see if you if you, if your method picks up on 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 all the premises you used and maybe all the bases they that were involved in them and everything else, then uh, it be, you can kind of see how that might well be. Uh, that's going to get around all the uh, uh, all the trouble. So that's uh, my answer to these closure question. I see. The, the skeptical challenge question, I mean, safety proponents like the idea that safety would somehow, um, I mean, there are two very different attitudes. I mean, there's Williamson's attitude in some places where we can get no grip on what's close uh, independently of what we know and don't know. If you're in that frame of mind, safety isn't going to kind of, might not do that much to meet a skeptical challenge because it's not going to, it's not going to be you'll explain why we know we're not brains in vats because brains in vats aren't close. If you can't get an independent purchase on closeness except via judgments about what we know and don't know, then the primary question will be, do we know whether or not we're brains in vats? And then yeah. if you say, uh, we know we're not brains in vats, that'll tell you, oh, they can't be close in those cases. So if you're in that frame of mind, it's not going to play that much explanatory role in vis-a-vis -in -vis why we it might have some structure, some useful structural insight of a KK variety might come out of it, but it's not really going to explain why you know you're not a brain in a vat. Uh, the more flesh you put on the bones of safety, um, uh, the more maybe you'll have something to say. Uh, but it's all, all going to depend on what, I mean, just the word safety, there's no magic in it. So it will depend a bit on what flesh you put on the bones. Um, um, I think, I mean, an awesome test case for, uh, I mean, a big decision is how much can you play the card that, well, if it takes a big tweak in reality to get there, then, it's not close. How much can you play that card? That's the kind of err uh, idea that you find. Uh, but that err uh, idea is also coming under pressure from the desire not to have it that you get to know in the in the 70, 80 case, you know, that in those bizarre cases, uh, or you, you you or maybe you know you want to you don't you don't you want to stop brains in bats knowing that they're not embodied. If you if you're playing that kind of game, then you should hesitate about saying that some 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 if something's a big tweak away, then it's um, um, uh, then it's epistemically irrelevant. Uh, so the, it's 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 very it's very challenging all of this. So uh, 
in the paper, Christina and I go through various epicycles and cases and thoughts and uh, in a very inconclusive way. Uh, a good test case to think about is the, the Boltzmann brain stuff. I mean, rather than think of, I mean, imagine we have a cosmology where there are tons of Boltzmann brains, you know, short lived brains, just there's tons more than, than not than ordinary people populating uh, the history of the universe, short lived brains with uh, worldly experiences. I mean, it's an awesome, it's an awesome challenge to think about, well, are we going to play the safety card there on the grounds that, well, it's a big tweak to get from a, from an embodied, even if there's a lot more Boltzmann brains than embodied brains, you'd have to have a big tweak in reality to get from a center with an embodied brain to a center. And is that the key card? Or should we be thinking, oh, being embodied is a lot more normal. And so even though there's a lot more of those, then, and then you think, hold on, how can you say being embodied is more normal if there's a lot more, uh, uh, Boltzmann brains than embodied brains, what conception of norm? I mean, it, so we go through some of this in the paper. And uh, as I say, I got clued into a lot of this talking to Jeremy. So uh, I don't, I don't want to claim any, uh, claim very much. Uh, and, and same for, um, same for Christina. So. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, next is Nurit. Um, yeah, I, I had a question related to what you just um, answered to Edvard. So I guess I was curious. I'm I'm not quite clear on the. So I guess some, some like I don't know when I first read I think Sosa's paper, the one that, that you mentioned that Richard mentions. Like the, the first thought I had was why would the skeptic ever accept that that we're in the good world? Um, but it seems that a lot of people kind of play with that assumption. And then we kind of like we're in the good world, and then we try to build everything uh, from that. And, and I know you you said that Leah, that the safety account doesn't seem to have much to say about why is it that we know that we have hands or or stuff like that. But yeah, I guess it's just more. It it does seem like the skeptic would just look at, at that kind of account and yeah, um, and not have to accept anything that's being said there. At the same time, it seems that a lot of people do treat skepticism as accepting that you're in the good world, but not, but that you still don't know um, that you have hands or stuff like that. I don't know if that made sense. I think it's good to um, distinguish a few kinds of things. Uh, one sort of question is, what could you do to convince someone that didn't accept them? They, they, they say, I'm worried. I'm worried, I'm worried whether or not I'm a Boltzmann brain or an embodied person, or I'm worried whether I'm, you know, for example, I'm worried, uh, or I'm worried whether or not it's a demon scenario. What could you do to actually bring them around? And I don't think, I don't think you should think of contemporary epistemology as having that much to do to say, to bring them around. I mean, I used to worry, I kind of, you know, I'm kind of uh, a bit obsessive compulsive. So no matter what precautions I took, when I was about a hundred yards down the road, I started to worry about whether I left the coffee um, the coffee pot on, you know, that's what I, I uh, after a while I got a better coffee pot that switched off automatically, which, which mm. definitely helps. I'd recommend that for people, but I'd worry whether I'd left the coffee pot on and, you know, I feel that some of the, you know, it's not like I could read Ernie Sosa and then, you know, I'd be all right. I mean, so, or I could read Tim Williamson and be, you know, so you don't want to think of these people as writing tracks to, to kind of cure people who are worried or somehow make them accept that they're, if, if they're worried. I mean, if you're worried whether or not you're uh, a victim of grand, grand, large scale illusion, you're not going to get rid of those worries by reading these books. And the people writing the book shouldn't be thinking you get rid. I mean, maybe you could take a pill or, you know, play some backgammon as Hume recommended or something and, you know, drink, drink. I think he said, drink a bit. Uh, you know, you can try things like that, but you can't read Ernie Sosa and then stop worrying. You know, if I'm worried, literally worried that I'm going to have like 
you know, I'm going to just have a fatal heart attack today. I mean, people do worry about those things. And I, I, I'm just not, I get in the frame of mind, I'm just not sure whether or not I will, and I'm uncertain, and I'm up in the air. I mean, you're not going to, I can't make it go away by reading these people. So, but they're doing a different thing, which is, um, suppose you are convinced that you have hands. Uh, are there other circumstances in which that conviction would account to knowledge? And then good news, if some of these philosophers are right, there are circumstances under which uh, you, um, um, uh, you, that conviction would amount to knowledge. And then you can use, if you're convinced, you can use that uh, if you you happen to be already be convinced you have hands and you buy their stories, you can answer the question, how do you know? Of course, if I'm talking to someone that's uncertain, uh, it's not going to convince them because that's the first project. But it's a way to tell yourself the story if you are convinced of how your conviction can amount to knowledge. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. I guess... I guess I was still uncertain of, I mean, it kind of seems like, well, if you're, I mean, with other kinds of disagreements, it seems that we can do more than just be like, well, you have to be convinced to kind of get this started. Um, with other kinds of disagreements, it seems that there's something that we can point towards um, to say something more, but yeah, I guess it. Well, it depends how, how systematic the, the skeptic is, I mean, if they believe all sorts of stuff, but it just have particular, you know, I, I buy all that, I'm just worried about, you know, it depends the particular thing that they're worried about, then there might be a strategy, but it, the more systematic their, their concern is, then it might be hard, you know? I mean, so it really depends a bit on, um, on how systematic their doubts are. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, if, if, the, if they say, oh, I know A will pass, but I'm not sure whether B will pass. And then you can maybe say things. Oh, don't you know, B's outperformed A every single every single time this year. So if you shouldn't be worried about B. If, if you know A will pass, you shouldn't be worried about B because B always does better than A. And they'll go, oh, then they're not worried anymore. <laughs> I mean, they might. I mean, who knows? I mean, you, you've got to, you've got to kind of play with their psychology. They might they might go. Well, now you're getting me worried about a. I mean, who knows how they're gonna. But you know, often often you can lock onto some things and then uh, you know get the get the epistemic comfort level to the conviction to spread by by taking some conviction anchors and then supplying things that will let, get help the conviction to spread. But you know. If you haven't got those conviction anchors to play off, or if they won't trust a word that you say anyway, or, what, or there's some systematic problem like that, then you're gonna be, you're gonna be dialectically in a lot of trouble. Awesome, thanks. Uh, I think we have a brief follow-up by Edward and then a question by Eduardo in that order. Yeah, I, I had a follow up on what Nuri mentioned about uh, skepticism. So it seems to me that uh, at least one way in which I uh, understand what Nuri was saying is that the, 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 the starting point of, of the skeptical argument seems like uh, a bit more and paradoxical because it seems that if we agree on our true beliefs and, and, we, and the skeptical is saying that we, we all have true beliefs about that we have hands, for example, but we cannot know that we have hands. Seems like kind of more, more and paradoxical if that's the kind of skeptic we are discussing with. So the alternative would be something like a, a Pironian skepticism or, or something like that in which we, we cannot even establish that true belief and we cannot even know whether this is the good case or not. Yeah, I mean, the vibe I was getting about the kind of skeptic that she had in mind, but maybe it's like someone who isn't convinced. I mean, they're not, it's not like someone, oh, well, I'm convinced I've got hands. I'm not worried about, I'm completely convinced I've got hands. I'm just worried is that knowledge. 
I didn't think that was the kind of character she, she had in mind. Um, yeah. uh, it, it, it was more the, uh, the ancient skeptical character that uh, would be refused to draw into commitment and maybe would offer some ad hominems or something, but wouldn't be drawn into a commitment themselves. Okay, okay. But I take your point that if you, uh, it looks a bit embarrassing to assert things and then also assert that you don't know them. Uh, right, yeah. A good thing to read, I mean, the classic, the classic defense of skepticism that I know of in the last 50 years is uh, Peter Unger's ignorance book. So uh, Unger's keenly aware of that kind of challenge. So I, I'd recommend, uh, like the, there's a chapter on the wages of ignorance, you know, where he confronts the fact that, I mean, he thinks that, you know, to a proposition is a reason only if you know it. And I mean, he thinks it makes a whole mess of, a whole mess of all sorts of things. And so asks himself, well, how am I to sort of think about the world if I can't say I have reasons anymore? I can't say I regret the P or I'm happy the P anymore. I can't, all these things are so entangled with knowledge that they all have to go. Uh, and how do I think about entitlement to assert if it's, if I don't have any reasons, because I don't know, then it doesn't seem rational. So what am I doing? And, you know, so I, yeah. I'd recommend having a look at that. That's, okay. uh, yeah. Great. Yeah, I think I'm um, next. Yes. Yeah. So, so I have, I have a question about the last part of your, your talk, the difference between modeling and analyzing. So uh, I would like you to, to tell us more about that, that distinction. Uh, so, so one way to understand uh, modeling is as this process of uh, idea, idealization and simplification in order to uh, simplify, for example, a computation uh, or in order to measure something uh, that, is, that doesn't give you the whole story, but at least it gives you something that you are, you are interested in. And, uh, but 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 something that happens when 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 you model at least in the in the uh, natural sciences is that uh, you're not worried about foundational issues, right? Uh, uh, so you have a working hypothesis, and then you you test, and because you want to measure something, and you simplify the computation by by that process. But here it seems that the rules of the game are are substantially different because now we are discussing a uh, foundational issue. We want to know what knowledge is. And uh, so, and, 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 and I'm not so sure that the sort of predictions that we are looking for when we do this, uh, so it seems that we have to do the, the, the foundational work before we, start modeling things before we start measuring things. Uh, so I, I'm not so, so clear about this, this uh, way of, of using the notion of modeling. Yeah, ma ma maybe, I mean, if you look at the models, maybe they're not so onto the foundational things that, that, that you're, you know, so think of these appearance reality models, you know, where, um, you know, in the model, you know, reality appears to have a certain value, like, you know, a stick has a certain length or a, uh, there's a certain temperature, and that might already be simplifying because maybe there aren't precise appearances and that sort, but, you know, you, you model, and then you're trying to model how, how much we know about the world, you know, um, where we're not, we're not interested in skeptics. We're more we're, we're more doing something more like cognitive science. You know, we we've assumed the skeptics are wrong. You know, a bunch of stuff. Okay, we're not we're not worried about the skeptics, but there's still just more local issues of how how do we think about that? Not you know, it can't be that you know if if it um, if it looks to be 17 centimeters 
and it happens to be exactly 17 centimeters, you're in a position to know it's exactly 17 centimeters. That's you, Appearances can't give you anything that precise. So how do we model what you do and don't know when you have an appearance and then maybe you have more appearances? How does that knowledge evolve? We're not worrying about the skeptic. We're sort of trying to think through, you know, sort of, you know, some model for how uh, precise appearances can give you imprecise knowledge in a way that might interface with, uh, with cognitive science even, uh, insofar as they're interested in questions about knowledge. So I'm not so sure, it's, we're not trying to say what knowledge is, we're not trying to refute the skeptic, we're trying to model how perceptual knowledge works. And, and it, it, it does seem like a good thing and a thing that, you know, epistemology is often too far too weak on. I mean, you get these things, well, it appears red and there's no defeaters and you know it's red. I mean, that, that, kind, that kind of slogan-esque philosophy uh, doesn't give you a very good feel at all for how precise appearances give you inexact knowledge about the world. And these, these, these models might, uh, might do some of that. So I'm not so sure that, these models are all engaging with the foundational questions. You, uh, you know, and suppose we want some kind of feel for how you could get closure uh, of how closure might uh, how how to think about uh, how to think about uh, safety in a in a closure friendly way. We're not, you know, we're not worrying about skepticism so much. In fact. We're assuming we know stuff and we're just trying to probe how it could be that deduct, competent deduction always extends knowledge. It might not quite be going after the foundational things that you're. So um, I don't know, there's some vague things. But uh, I, think, I think part of the thing is it's, uh, these models aren't quite trying to resolve certain kinds of foundational concerns. I mean, it, they might, they might be like a bunch of the cognitive uh, a social scientists taking a fair bit for granted vis-a-vis uh, -vis those foundational concerns. Like, of course we know a fair bit about the external world by looking, you know? Right, okay, okay, thanks. Uh, next up is Diego. Well, I have a, a question about uh you work on both membranes. Um, okay. I haven't read it, but I'm I'm looking forward to to reading it. But like, I wonder if uh, there is a kind of view about thermodynamics that could help with like the Boltzmann brain problem, which is like the the Mentaculus view, um, which is something like, oh, when you make this kind of thermodynamic. Um, like when you use thermodynamic probabilities, you must also insert an extra condition, which is that the universe started with a really low entropy. Uh, and then if you if you add that extra condition, then it's it's not likely that you're a Boltzmann brain. You mean then there won't be a lot of Boltzmann brains? What? You mean there won't be a lot of Boltzmann brains? There, yeah. they, there wouldn't be a lot of Boltzmann brains, but just because like when you predict something like entropy raises, but when you retrodict, it won't raise because there will be like a, a really low entropy condition at the beginning of time or something like that. So it's, it's actually not likely that you're a Boltzmann brain. Just like, just like when you, for example- Yeah, uh, so-, so yeah. Uh, I don't know if- We were doing that, that something a lot less on. ambitious, which is um, you might think there, there are two different games you might play. One game is, oh, even if there are tons of Boltzmann brains, embodied people can know they have hands. Uh, and then the polite question is, well, how? And then you try various things. We were playing that game. There's another game you might think, oh, if there are lots of Boltzmann brains, we're in trouble. Uh, but happily, the best physics says, uh, not too many Boltzmann brains or none at all. You're playing the second game. We weren't getting into the second game. I think that's a perfectly good game. I think the first game is interesting too, but you know, and 
There are all sorts of moves that you could try using safety, closeness, normality, this and that to say, hey, embodied people can know they have hands, even if there's the world, reality is flooded with Boltzmann brains. And that's, um, yeah, that seemed like an interesting, an interesting exercise for the pur purpose of probing the foundations of knowledge, as it were. So right. just for that purpose, it seemed kind of helpful to pretend that reality is flooded with Boltzmann brains. We also talk about Boltzmann bubbles, which I uh, learned about from Eddie Chen, where a Boltzmann bubble, it's not, it's like a Boltzmann bubble has hands and in fact, it lives in a city, but you know, it's it's a it's a it's a hundred you know maybe it's a ten thousand year bubble that came from a quantum fluctuation. So when you try and retrodict back to the Big Bang, everything goes wrong. And so uh, you might think, well, there are a lot more Boltzmann bubbles than there are you know uh, bubbles of that you know regions of that size with more normal uh, pathways back to the Big Bang. So. Uh, um, Right. Uh, I, 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 I don't feel know. those are cool too to think about. So yeah. I don't know if would it would help like to to like say something like, oh, the the actual objective chances are these ones. Uh, the, are these chances in which it's not likely that there are both and brains or, or the actual object yeah objective and that's the chances, second game and right. then maybe that's even know, the second game. It, right. it, it'd be right. great. If, I guess it'd be good for the I'm not I, I'm not making a judgment on the second game. So yeah. The, um, um, um. Yeah, I can, I can take the time to ask a question myself now, or I was told Nuri by Nuri that she had another question, maybe. So I want her to to go ahead first. Uh, go ahead that. if you want. Well, we've okay. got time for both, haven't we? So in either order, it's good. All right. So my question was, I mean, you did not talk much about it or not at all, I would say in, in the talk, because of course you didn't have time to, to cover everything that was in the, in the paper, but I wanted to ask about contextualism because it seems that it pops up again and again as a way to, when suitably combined uh, with safety, to yield an, an okay result at times. Although I feel that you're somehow uh, skeptical about the, the prospects of contextualism, and you even discuss a, a particular problem that it has when when, when dealing with uh, to, to to make it so that that it could at the same time provide for non-skeptical scenarios in which we have con uh, knowledge about the future, for example, but at the same time where there are contexts in which you can you can say, for example, that that you're not going to get hit by lightning even if you're going to be out. All the time, or something like that. So, so I wanted to ask because because it doesn't have its own section in the paper. It just it seems like a resource that it's you know like working around. But I don't know what are your thoughts on it. I don't. I mean, I, I think you you've tracked the paper pretty well. Which is, uh, I mean, it was definitely a theme as you saw. You can add a dose of contextualism to the to a lot of ideas where you basically have some favored conception of how closeness works where it's context dependent and then you have the verb no being context dependent along with it or something you know so there are um it's it's not completely fresh everything we say in the, I'll just touch on one, one, one interesting thing to think about are the limits to contextualism. Like, are we gonna allow context where, even though there's a high objective chance, that, a super high objective chance that P, there's no close world that P, I mean, for example, or, or are we gonna not allow context like that? How far can, uh, can closeness kind of run free of ob objective chance? And that's the thing that um, Maria and I were interested in, Maria Lassen and Anio elsewhere, like, um, you know, I mean, suppose it, in the favored conception of chance that there's, um, a massive chance that a group uh, will be, 
someone in a group will be struck by lightning and suppose none of them will be struck by lightning and you know it's not like one of them actually ended up coming closer to lightning than the other um you know if you have this chance to high chance to closeness constraint you'll want it well if there's a high chance one of them will then there's got to be a close case where one of them will which means that you can't know none of them won't but you know if you can't know you can't know none of them will right be struck by lightning but if you can't know none of them will then how do we think about the individual cases if you start saying but for each one you know they won't then you've got a tension with uh multi-premise closure because if you can in a if you can know each one that they won't be struck by lightning then it looks like given closure so it, I think there are interesting challenges here to know, understand the limits on contextualism and how it in, interacts with other structural ideas, but it, it's certainly something to try. Um, uh, exactly how promising or helpful it is will depend on, you know, we'd have to look at the particular deployment that someone's suggesting and then we'd, I'd, I'd have to have a look, you know, but, but you're right, it's sort of floating around there. But as a as a theme that's being downplayed because there's so much else going on, so sorry right. to not be very. No, it's helpful. okay. It's okay. I, I was. I mean, I was interested, if I may, in this follow up, because when you're discussing the several ways in which there is danger for our beliefs, right? That some some of them come up in the Williamson uh, text and bits. That there's so many ways for it to to be wrong because you know you could have a very similar but false belief. You could have uh, acquired something very similar from a similar source, but because it was like the guru could have said whatever came to their mind. So, so it's not really like, and so maybe I was thinking this sort of picking and choosing, which is the way in which things can go wrong. is actually also context dependent. Right. right. We, but, but, but you started off that speech talking about danger. So one thing, if you're really going the danger route, one thing to probe is, well, to what extent is the ordinary notion of danger context dependent? It might not be that much. I mean, it might be like if the lion's super glued to the spot, there just might not be an ordinary context in which it's true to say, you know, that person's in danger of being eaten. I mean, they're just not. I mean, like, of course, there might be people who think it's in the bed. I'm, I'm not so sure that there are contexts where it's true in which you can truly utter the words that person's in danger of being eaten you know i mean you know if or the, or the or the tiger's dead but no one realizes it the tiger isn't in danger of eating you there's no context in which it's true to say the tiger's in danger of eating you it's still true that the person doesn't know whether or not the tiger's about to jump on them if they're not if, if they can't tell whether they're dead so you know the might but, but what you did in that speech is it started with danger and danger might be not be context sensitive in the way that could easily is. So it's gonna, that's why it depends a bit on what ideology we wanna go into and not think that there's this sort of all purpose safety theory out there. There are some people running with danger, some similarity, some could have easily, and we'd have to go through it one at a time and see what it might be like to infuse it with heavy doses of contextualism. Yeah. Thank you. That was really illuminating. Yeah. Uh, there was one question left. Is that right? And then, or how are we doing? Um, yeah, I had a, I had a question left, but I feel I've already asked a few, so I don't know if nobody else has one. I. I'll do it, but. But I think we can also continue to. Yeah, we're at the time, I think. So Perfect. I think that's, yeah, that's it for this this part of the questions, Jaime. Well, we, we could chat. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can answer any questions from anyone. Uh, we're, we're about to go to a different link. Is that the idea, Jaime? Or? Yes. Or Gabby? Yes. No. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go up in the other link and, okay. and finish up. Well, thank you, everyone, for all your questions. That was, that was fun. And uh, 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 Christina uh, Christina's going to look at the uh, recording, too, and then we'll, uh, we'll see. I, d I don't know if we've got time to tweak things, but I'll have to check what the, when, the, uh, when the final version's due. So 
but uh, th thank you so much. It was helpful. Um, I will go to the other link and then, yeah. Okay. Um, bueno, muchas gracias a todos por su presencia. Thank you everybody for your presence here. Uh, that was it for today. Eso, eso fue todo por hoy. Gracias. <laughs>